Let's try that again. Hi, good morning. It's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Here I thought... <laughs> the reason I had a delay is because I had problems with OBS, and of course, uh, I reset everything, and I forgot to do that. Hi, good morning. It's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. How are you guys? Let's, let's give it a, you know, another try. So, uh, anyway... Hi, if you guys have any problems and you ever need to know anything about space, just go to everydayastronaut.com and you can, uh, yeah, look at this. You can you can find out anything about upcoming missions. So uh, everydayastronaut.com, you can click on pre-launch previews and you will get a full rundown on today's mission. So uh, today's mission is taking off, as you can tell on the countdown clock over there, which actually is working again. Yes, uh, in 19 minutes and 50 seconds, assuming everything is still going on time, which we'll find out here really soon. Uh, but that is taking off today, and the launch window this morning is 9... Launch right? launch. ULA's launch is starting, too. This is good. Um, we'll we'll finish up the pre-launch preview, and then we'll pop over to their stream. Their stream's probably going to be really short. There's not a lot they can talk about because it is a top-secret thing. So we'll tell you what we know, and then... We'll pop over and watch launch. So, uh, okay, anyway, so this is called the uh, this is the United Space Space Force 7 OTV-6. So the sixth launch of uh, this little space plane. You'll see what we're talking about here in a second. T today's launch is uh, provided by United Launch Alliance. They're the launch provider, obviously. The customer is the United States Space Force, uh, the NASA, the U.S. Air Force, and the U.S. Navy. Uh, the rocket is the... Is the Smallest, most stripped down version of the Atlas V, but it does have the five meter fairing, which I think is pretty unusual to have a, the biggest fairing, but the smallest rocket. So there's no solid rocket boosters strapped onto it. There's no, uh, there's only a single Centaur upper stage. So of course, remember the, um, the the Atlas naming scheme goes, there's three numbers. So the first number is the size of your fairing. So it's either four or five, four meter fairing or five meter fairing. Then the next number is the number of solid rocket boosters strapped onto it. And it can be anywhere from zero to five. And then the third number is the number of RL-10s on the Centaur upper stage. So the Centaur upper stage can have a, uh, a dual RL-10 Centaur upper stage. And that's only flown once on the Atlas V, one time. Uh, and that was just in December for the uh, for OFT for the first crewed test launch or the uncrewed test launch of the Boeing Starliner. So um, yeah, so we'll see more of those, and those would be called the N22, no fairing, two solid rocket boosters, two RL10 Centaur upper stages. So um, yeah, so the space the the launch location is Space Launch Complex or SLIC 41 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station uh, in Florida. This is where all Atlas is launched from. Um, at least on the East Coast. <laughs> uh, and remember, Slick denotes that it's from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. And technically, we, we realize at this exact moment, I don't think it's fully been renamed in all of the, the books, kind of, as Space Force Station. The the signs and stuff are, are changed out to Space Force Station. But yeah, regardless, who, who I don't quite remember. But the payload mass um, is up to 8,123 kilograms. But the reason they can use only the small, little, tiny, the most stripped down version of the Atlas V is because this is only going to low Earth orbit. Uh, will they be attempting to recover the first stage? This is not a cap This is currently not a capability of the United Launch Alliance. The Vulcan will have some recoverability. Uh, the first stage uh, will not land. They will be. A, they do not attempt to recover the fairings either. This will be the 84th flight of an Atlas V rocket, which uh, is incredible. This is the sixth flight of the X-37B, so of the space plane. So here we have uh, a picture by Jeff Barrett that shows kind of the, the graphic of the, the launch vehicle. And this is the secret space plane, the X-37B. And this thing is just so weird. We honestly don't know that much about it it goes up into space it has this little payload bay it's not very big this is it's obviously small enough to fit within a five meter fairing so it's it's not very big that's what 15 feet wide or so so uh yeah it's it's not a huge vehicle so its wingspan is less than that obviously uh it's got a little bit of pit stains from <laughs> being in space and sweating. I'm not exactly sure. And then what's interesting is on this particular launch below here, there is a new uh, service module that is also classified. So we don't really know that much about it. The one thing we do know is this will be one of the first times they are launching. Uh, so they have a, a couple things. If you want to read about all the, the different things that they're doing, uh, but one of them that's really interesting, they're going to be transforming solar power 
into radio frequency microwave energy. And I believe that's the first time we'll be taking solar energy and transvert and, and, and transforming it into microwave energy. I think, I think so. Um, yeah, it's a really cool vehicle. Here's, uh, it was originally intended to launch on the space shuttle, which can you imagine <laughs> a shuttle in your shuttle, uh, which would have been so cool. We hear you like shuttles. So we put a shuttle in your shuttle, but that shows about how big it is. It's not a very large vehicle, but yeah, super cool. Uh, everyone say thanks to Flo for writing this, and uh, yeah, super cool. So anyway, let's tune in. Let's see how they're doing this morning. I'm just going to pop over like this for one second, and we'll check in with the vehicle and check in with the with the launch. All right, hold on. Transmission. Produced in ULA's 1.6 million square foot factory in Decatur, Alabama, the 501 is comprised of a common core booster powered by an RD-180 engine and a Centaur second stage powered by an Aerojet Rocketdyne RL-10C1 engine. A Ruag 5-meter diameter we want to 1.6 million square foot factory in Decatur, Alabama. The 501 is comprised of a common core booster powered by an RD-180 engine and a Centaur second stage powered by an Aerojet Rocketdyne RL-10C1 engine. A Ruag 5-meter diameter payload fairing protects the X-37B orbital test vehicle during ascent. On April 23rd, the Atlas V first stage was transported to the Vertical Integration Facility, or VIF, at Space Launch Complex 41 where cranes lifted the 33-meter or 107-foot-long booster onto the Mobile Launch Platform, or MLP. Two days later, the pre-assembled interstage adapter, Centaur upper stage, and lower half of the payload fairing was delivered to the VIF and lifted atop the Atlas V booster. The stacking of the rocket was completed on May 5th, when the X-37B, encapsulated in a payload fairing, was mated to the Centaur. Atlas V launch countdowns begin with moving the rocket from the VIF to the pad. At approximately 10 a.m. Thursday, the quarter-mile trip began using six components to complete the 20-minute trip. Weighing in at about 2 million pounds, the Mobile Launch Platform, or MLP, supports the rocket and contains air conditioning, electrical, and commodities, while the undercarriages bear the weight of the MLP and rocket. Two rail cars lead the move with the payload van providing communication to the payload, while the ground van houses the ground support for the rocket. At the rear of the convoy, the portable environmental control system provides air conditioning to the payload and rocket. Finally, trackmobiles provide the power to move the convoy. Oh, uh, so the Atlas cute. V rocket stands about 60 meters or 20 stories and weighs about 346,000 kilograms or 760,000 pounds fully fueled. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna pop in here just to say hi to everyone real quick and, and read some of your comments. Uh, first off, we have a bunch of new members, and so thanks to to Victor Pierce, David Crawford, Andrew Baru uh, uh, Espadre. Hi, Espadre, how are you guys? Uh, Derek SP says it's too loud. Um, you can use the volume knob if you need. <laughs> I don't know. Sorry. Uh, May for the uh, Mat Mate Farkas for the membership. Hey, I do want to point out in this shot real quick that we're seeing. Oh, when we were seeing that shot, we'll talk about the condensation in a second, because that was a really good shot of the condensation. And I always like to remind people, oh, here's here's some videos of the X-37. I actually want to listen to this real quick or see what... Man. Project and pride of the U.S. Air Force in Boeing. It launches into low Earth orbit and stays there as needed for as long as it takes to get the job done. The X-37B... Well, that's the craziest thing. I didn't even talk about it, so... They go, you know, it goes up into space and stays there as long as it needs to get the job done. That's the crazy thing. The It holds the record for the longest time a vehicle stayed up in orbit and then come back down from orbit uh, intact, <laughs> at least. And uh, at over two years, its last mission, it spent over two years on orbit and then came back down, no problem, which is which is quite insane. Okay, here we go. This is what I want to talk about with the condensation. So you notice here, just we'll see this at every rocket launch, at least anyone that has liquid fuels in it. So that is just the condensation pouring off of the rocket as the liquid, there's liquid oxygen in this vehicle. And liquid oxygen is extremely cold, you know, almost, almost minus 200 degrees centigrade. I believe it's about 108, minus 180 degrees Celsius. And of course, it's warm out. It's not minus 180 degrees Celsius in Florida. I don't care <laughs> what day it is. It is not that cold. So obviously, as it warms up from the ambient temperature around it, um, it expands and turns into a gas. And when liquid oxygen turns into a gas, it expands a thousand times. 
So of course, when it does that phase change, they need to uh, bleed it out and let it go. But it's still really cold. So as it comes in contact with the humidity in the air uh, and the, the water droplets in the air, those do turn into little uh, ice droplets and form condensation around the vehicle. So it always, um, almost every rocket looks like it's like smoking, but it's because it's freezing, freezing cold at launch. And that's just something that it, it still boggles my mind a little bit that a launch vehicle is just absolutely freezing cold <laughs> before it launches. And even you can see on the screens here, um, there's condensation. We are, it is such a crazy time that we're living in a time where everyone has to wear masks to work at this point, isn't it? I'm glad to see everyone's safe though. And uh, yeah. So let me keep answering some of your guys' questions here. <laughs> uh, so Paul Boyle says, hi from Ireland. Awesome. Thank you, Paul. Um, Miles Miller says, are you going to be going down for the first Crew Dragon launch? Your fellow island. Thank you, Miles. So speaking of safety, that is actually something I, I think I, okay. I did actually get full permission, uh, or, uh, one of the, uh, a member of the press to get permission to come down to Florida. Uh, there's not very many people that NASA, they, they limited the amount of people that can come see the launch in person. And I think I have to go. Um, I would be taking extreme precautions myself. And um, yeah, I think I'm going to go. I kind of have to. I mean, right? <laughs> but yeah, uh, so I, I think I'm going. That's already in 10 days or so, or not even. Yeah, 10 days. Is that what it is? What is today? That's seven, yeah, 10 days from right now. So that means I would be leaving in basically a week from today. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah, um, it's going to be an, an incredible mission. And don't forget, too, speaking of crewed missions, this launch pad here, Slick 41, you can notice there's a crew access arm on it. Um, ooh. Wait. To proceed. Are we going to the, the go, no, go count? Red Hold line on. monitor. Verify red line monitor and event table are in the correct configuration for terminal count. Verified. RC, verify solar radiation acceptable for launch. Verified. No minus nine minutes. No Before minus. we pull the team, let's watch a quick message from Leanne Corette, President and CEO of Boeing Defense, Space, and Security. Well, to everyone I'm... supporting today's historic launch of oh, the X 37B, thank you. On behalf of the entire Boeing company, I want to express my appreciation for your work to achieve this critical mission. Since the X-37B's launch in 2010, it has shattered all expectations. Every time it launches into space, it achieves first. And there is no other program that provides our nation an unrivaled capability to rapidly test and integrate new space technologies. None of these achievements would have been possible without your hard work and dedication. Good luck today. Thank you for everything you do Stay safe and be well. Go Atlas, go Centaur, go SF7, and go X37B. <laughs> I have not seen her before. She's cute. Prior to the status check. That was fun. I like the enthusiasm. I appreciate some good enthusiasm in, in aerospace. That's awesome. This is one of my favorite things about ULA launches. As we get to hear a we go no go pull. We 30 minute hold as we continue towards and, liftoff. In a few moments, launch conductor. Yeah, and I'm going to explain something too. It's always confusing when if you're not used to a ULA launch, they'll do a planned 30 minute hold, and so their countdown clock is currently stuck at T minus four, which you see up in the top left corner. Um, but you'll notice that um, that my clock here gives us that six minute 43 seconds or so. So. Um, yeah, so they're going to be doing a, a go no no go poll, and then we'll hear from each person in mission uh, here. They're going to be doing it right now. Of the launch team. L minus seven minutes. Status check. To proceed with terminal count. Atlas systems. Propulsion. Go. Hydraulics. Go. Pneumatics. Go. LO2. Go. Water. Go. Centaur systems. Propulsion. Go. Pneumatics. Go. LO2. Go. LH2. Go. Asgas. Go. Electrical systems. Airborne. Go. Ground. Go. Facility. Go. RFFTS. Go. Flight control. Go. TCQ. Go. Operation support. Go. Tom. Go. Umbilical. Go. ECS. 
Go. Red line monitor. Go. Quality. Go. Op safety manager. Go. ULA safety officer. Go. Vehicle system engineer. Go. Anomaly chief. Go. Range coordinator. Clear to proceed. Launch director. Launch vehicle is ready to launch. Mission director. This is the mission director. You have permission to launch. Proceeding with the count. ALC. Verify T0 is set for 1314 Zulu. Verified. Polling is complete, and the ULA launch team and the Space Force's mission director are go for launch. From T minus four minutes until launch, you will be listening to Dylan Rice and his team performing the final steps in the countdown procedure. You will hear the team call out that Atlas liquid oxygen topping has been secured, followed about a minute later by the call out for transferring the Atlas and Centaur stages from ground facility power to internal battery power. At T minus one minute and 55 seconds, the team will command the launch sequencer to start, followed shortly by securing the Centaur liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen topping activity. At T minus one minute and 40 seconds, the team will command the flight control system to launch enable and arm the flight termination system. In the final minute, Atlas tanks will be verified at flight pressures followed by verification of Centaur tank pressures. A final status check of Atlas, Centaur, and USSF-7 readiness is conducted at T-25 seconds. At T-3 seconds, the RD-180 engine will roar to life. After liftoff, you'll hear Rob Kesselman providing launch vehicle ascent data. So yeah, I really, I, I enjoy that that go, no-go pull. I always think that's cool. It feels very, uh, it just feels official, you know, it lets you know that the launch is coming up. Oh, so. minus four minutes, 30 seconds. Okay, so, transfer space so they're at 430 power. minus 430. So my Roger. clock is four is is about All 30 complete. seconds Roger. ahead of theirs. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn mine off. Which, <laughs> whoops, I'm gonna put myself there. This is Atlas so Mission like Control at T minus launch. four minutes and holding. We anticipate releasing the hold in just a few moments. Mark, cool. The time and, will be T minus four minutes and counting. Three, two, one, mark. There we go. So now it's basically T in its three minutes fifty five seconds. It's now in its terminal countdown. The countdown so. clock has resumed, and we are go for launch at nine fourteen a.m. Eastern. So on on their end, this is basically like them saying yes, like we're good to go, boom. And now the launch is going through its final bits of sequences, and uh, and <laughs> this is almost something that that is is different because they go through all the fueling top offs and do everything beforehand. Then they check everything's good to go, and then they say okay, uh, and commit to it. Now SpaceX does it almost the opposite, where they they'll start with an empty rocket, and uh, like forty five minutes ahead of time, or an hour or something ahead of time, they'll do a go no go poll uh, internally, and then they basically hit a button, and the rest of the thing is automated. All the fuel up, all of the everything is automated um, from that point on, which is not the way that that this system works. Uh, just different. Uh, the, one of the things about the Atlas is it can sit on the pad for a long time. You know, it can sit there for hours fueled up and, and repressed and ready for flight. Um, the Falcon nine, once they fill it with liquid oxygen, because they're relying on it being super chilled pretty much once they commit to filling it with oxygen, they can't just sit there for too long. Hold on. Let's hear what they're saying. Um, they just said something. <laughs> oh, maybe not. Looks like a beautiful morning in Florida, though. And the Atlas looks... I've, I don't know if I've honestly ever remember seeing an Atlas V without solid rocket boosters and a 5-meter fairing. That's really cool, actually. But yeah, you, you can see uh, those are the lightning towers. People ask about those often. And someone told me recently they're not to attract lightning and make it so lightning would hit one of those towers is actually to create uh, a grounding so they ground uh those towers obviously with, with a lot of one minute 59 seconds okay with a lot of cables and stuff and that creates some kind of like Launch almost start. airspace that is uh that is lightning uh we'll say lightning proof. Centaur, lo2 t minus one minute 40 seconds Launch enabled. 137. FTS on. Oh, so. So. T minus 90 seconds. The launch vehicle, payload, ground systems, and eastern range are go for launch. Sweet. So, Flo in our Discord channel uh, does say the. T minus 1 minute 20 seconds. 
the last uh, 501, so last time they launched a five meter fairing was five year a five meter fairing with no solid rocket boosters was five years ago. Roger. One ten. Vent valves locked. Okay, it sounds like people are requiring the, the proper confirmation right now. T minus, T -minus one, one minute. minute. Rock, report range status. Range green. And now they need to ask me, is the pointy end up and the flaming end down? And the answer is yes. They did it. <laughs> they put the pointy end up. <laughs> did you guys see that the Space Force, the United States Space Force actually tweeted, it's not as simple as the pointy end up, flaming end down. And I was like, I think I'm happy about this. <laughs> that was close. Thank you, guys. I almost Second. failed. Almost lost my job. 25. ECS reduced for launch. Status check. Go Atlas. Go Centaur. Go Space Force 7. Sweet. All right. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, Four, three, two, one. There's ignition and liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket with USSF-7 for the United States Space Force on a mission dedicated to America Strong. Good. Wow! Without the solid rocket boosters, it. has gone to closed loop propellant utilization control. You were hearing the voice of Rob Kesselman providing April launch vehicle ascent data. The PCR roll program. Without the solids. Vehicle body rate look good. Was so slow. Now, 35 seconds into flight. Atlas is now just under one mile in altitude. Traveling at 900 miles per hour. Engine pump speeds and injector pressures are in family for this thrust level. Shot. The vehicle has now completed the pitch yaw roll program. Now I need to remind you, it, although it looks like there's kind of two flames and, and two and there's two nozzles, it is a single engine. There's only a single turbo pump. Now 70 seconds into flight. That runs that RD-180 engine. Now 4 miles in altitude, 0.4 miles downrange distance, traveling at 1,200 miles per hour. Wow. That's vehicle a good has shot. passed Mach, Mach 1. Vehicle is now passing through maximum dynamic pressure, max Q. As I talked about in my uh, video about rocket pollution. RD 180 is now throttling down slightly uh, as commanded. You notice that condensation trail is just a, a layer in the atmosphere. It's kind of in between the troposphere and the mesosphere. And uh, that's also the same area of condensation that when. When jets are flying and you see those condensation trails ahead, it's just a kind of phenomenon based on air pressure and uh, and the actual uh, you know the altitude, air pressure, and the temperature as well. So I that RD one eighty is an incredible engine. That's that is a video that we're working on at the moment. Is a video talking about all of the different um, Russian engines, and the RD one eighty is definitely one of the. Half the weight it was at liftoff, burning propellant at a rate of more than 2,600 pounds per second. Yeah, it's one of the best engines. Approximately two minutes remaining in the Atlas booster phase of flight. Sorry, did I say chemtrails instead of condensation trails? <laughs> Since our reaction system is now pressurizing flight, flight levels. It's morning. I can't remember things. Atlas is now throttling to maintain two and a half G acceleration limit. And now notice that once the vehicle's out of the atmosphere, uh, out of most of the atmosphere like this. 80 seconds into flight. Vehicle is 44 miles in altitude, 40 miles downrange distance, traveling at 4,500 miles per hour. Okay, once that shot there, you can see now you actually see some of the black soot coming out of the, the exhaust. Whereas before, in the atmosphere, you don't really see that soot. Mm -hmm. Something that I learned after I made that video about rocket pollution uh, is that the soot is only visible really uh, once it's out of the atmosphere because in the atmosphere it actually does an afterburning effect and a lot of it still gets burnt off um, and that's why it's glowing so much in the atmosphere. But as it gets out of the atmosphere, it actually gets dimmer and dimmer and dimmer because it doesn't hit any oxygen 
and continue to after do afterburning. And that's cool too. They, they And Centaur Forward Load Reactor has also jettisoned successfully. Atlas is now throttling up to a four point six G acceleration limit. Centaur has begun the boost phase chill down sequence. Atlas is now at 4.6 Gs and maintaining that acceleration limit. So people on our Discord channel are asking why is there, uh, well, Miles on our Discord is, is asking why they go to that animation. And that animation isn't just like a preloaded animation. It's actually a real-time telemetry based on what the vehicle's doing. So when it shows little RCS firing and stuff, that is telemetry put into an animation. It's actually a really advanced thing. Can Here we go. Can for stage on. separation? Stage set. We have successful stage separation. Restart on the RL-10. We have ignition. Mess one. There we go. That's good. <laughs> now remember, the Centaur is extremely efficient. Centaur has now begun the first of two RL-10 burns in today's mission. This Recently, I had a chance to speak with Boeing's Jim Chilton about the X-37B. Jim was over in Boeing's Mission Control Center at the Kennedy Space Center. Let's take a look. So uh, they likely they likely will not end up doing uh, any more than that because it is a, a classified mission. So we probably won't hear anything more than that. But the thing that's crazy is that the um, the the RL-10 engine on the upper stage, on the center upper stage, is extremely underpowered. Well, I guess it's it's not underpowered because if it, if it performs what it needs to do, it's as powerful as it needs to be. But it's extremely efficient. It's one of the most efficient rocket engines in the world, which is why when you couple that with, um, you need to have a, a pretty powerful booster to be able to get it high enough and then the Centaur just kind of ekes itself into, into orbit, basically. But once it's up in orbit, it has an unbelievable amount of energy left over. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just a super, super different way of going about uh, things compared to, say, the Merlin engine from SpaceX's uh, Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. The, the upper stage Merlin engine is massively overpowered. It's not very efficient for an upper stage engine. And those two engines are about as opposite as you get. And the... The open so the Merlin engine is is open cycle, meaning it still has the gas generator just dumping its exhaust overboard that runs the pumps, and the RL10 is an expander cycle engine, so it doesn't even have a, a pre burner. It it's extremely efficient. So we'll, I'll need to talk about that more in an upcoming video. So um, I've got a lot of questions to answer for you guys. So and likely, like I said, this is actually probably going to be the end of the launch coverage. So I'll stick around here and, and answer some of your questions. Uh, we're probably going to have quite a long day because I'm also going to be trying to stream if there is uh, Starship stuff today, too. So, um, yeah. Okay, so uh, let's see. So back to Miles Miller's question about going down to DM2. Uh, one thing that I need to mention, and I should say this, is that that Jim Bridenstine and the people at NASA are requesting that the public does not come down. Uh, Loopy in our Discord channel had a really good point saying, um, at some point, everyone's individual actions do become group actions. So if everyone says, you know, it's not a big deal if I come down, it's still going to mean everyone's coming down to the launch. And they're just trying to really keep the area safe from having, they were originally guessing, uh, <laughs> they were originally guessing it was going to be something like uh, a million people or, or half a million people or something, a huge number of people coming down for DM2. Uh, at this point, I think with, with everything going on today, it would not be safe if a million people all of a sudden flooded the Space Coast from all over the world. Uh, and so just in order to keep the area safe, keep the workers safe, keeping the restaurants safe, you know, keeping uh, astronauts safe, for that reason, just please don't. <laughs> uh, I think it's really that simple. So, um, but I will be taking extreme precaution. And uh, as part of my job, I think it is uh, a little more necessary. And especially when you get the invitation to be one of the few, uh, there's not very many media in, invited to DM2. And I think because I do have the invite, I think it's a pretty important thing to, yeah. Okay, so anyway, let's keep going here. Thank you, Miles. Uh, Derek SP, it's so secret, then why can I see it? Checkmate, round earthers. Well, uh, so basically, it is it is it is actually pretty unique in the fact that they kind of tell us ab about it even going up and stuff. I mean... Yeah, it, it's one of those things, it's top secret, but it's like, 
very well known top secret, you know, but we still have no idea like what actually happens during that two year mission. I have no idea, but it is, yeah, a super cool little vehicle. Uh, Jan, thanks for the membership or Jan. Uh, thank you, Nathan. Thank you for saying hi, uh, Derek SP solar power to microwaves. So a radio, uh, you're actually not wrong. In a sense, yeah, but it's in order to transmit power. That's the difference is that the power is being transmitted through the microwaves. And in theory, then you can have a, a microwave receiver down here on Earth and you could convert solar into microwaves. The cool thing about it is that it could penetrate through clouds. So you could receive, you know, especially if you had um, if you had a couple uh, satellites in the right position, you could receive 24-7 energy from the sun, no matter where you are on earth. I, I think that's, we talked about it a little bit on the podcast that I do our ludicrous future one time, I think just this last week, we we're talking about this mission. Um, so every week I do a, a podcast called our ludicrous future. Uh, definitely check it out here on YouTube or on any of your podcast platforms. Uh, but one of the things that I like about it is, or one of the things that we were talking about is that, that, you know, you can do 24 seven full power from the sun, even though it's, you know, yeah, but the, the, the real issue we we're talking about is actually grid storage. So having the ability to store power and, and regulate the right amount of power. That's why oftentimes you'll see windmills that are not spinning because they're already at max capacity and there's nowhere to put that power. So off. Yeah. So there you go. Long, long thing. <laughs> um, OK, so let's keep going here. Uh, Jason S. After this, my daughter and I are going to launch our first model rocket. That's awesome, Jason. Good luck to you and your daughter. Everyone wish them a uh, happy launch. That's that's a really fun hobby to get into, but be careful because you can get way too into it. It can be very addicting, especially when you start getting... I have some friends that still do like high-powered rockets and stuff. It is nuts, but it's really fun. That sounds like a good, fun thing to do uh, on a Sunday. So good good luck, Jason. Um, Huger Se uh, Huber Sept, thanks for the membership. Um... um Okay, I'm just kind of making sure we're not missing any mission stuff here. So, okay, uh, Huber, thanks for the membership. Grigory, uh, thank you very much. Keep going. Jelly Dude, hey, Tim, I'm having trouble trying to build the X37B in KSP. Can you attempt to build one in a new video soon? I'm starting to lose sleep on building it. Well, absolutely. We could actually do that after this. I, I feel like it's, it's probably time to do a little bit of Kerbal after this. So uh, for those of you sticking around, I will build the X37B. Uh, stick it inside of a Atlas V ish vehicle and we will uh, yeah that'll be a lot of fun we'll just do it real quick so hopefully it answers some of your questions about how to build it um, thanks for asking jelly dude I feel like it's been a long time since we've done any kind of Kerbal so um, yeah a Lionel L you definitely must go if you can well I'm thinking that's what I am going to have to do uh, thank you Lionel uh, Paul, hi, Tim. Have you ever visited a deep space communications complex like the one in Canberra? I have not visited Canberra's, uh, but I have been to, let's see, um, I've been out to one in Nevada or Arizona. Wait, New Mexico. New Mexico. That's where it is. Uh, and I've been to the actual, re the main like uh, room where all the deep space communication networks link, and that's at JPL. So I've, I've been to those two. I've been in that room, too. But as far as uh, a more of a complex, I, I really haven't like, properly visited one. So I definitely need to. That'd be super fun. Uh, Matt Horkin, uh, prospects of a, of a crude X-37 variant modification. I don't think we'll ever see that, most likely. Although it seems like it'd be a really nice little vehicle. Um, ooh, Tori's got a mustache? Tori looks great with a mustache. I gotta hear Tori with a mustache talk. And I wanna share that all of us here are inspired by your example and are continuing to do our part to help with national security and to make sure you have the space-based tools that help you do your job. We are America strong and together we will get through this crisis. Thank you. From Vandenberg okay, not only can Tori grow a mustache, he can grow a great mustache. Holy cow. Wow. Touche, Tori Bruno. That was great. What a great Tori stash. Okay, so, <laughs> um, yeah, the X-37 as a, as, a, uh, as a crude version, uh, we will see Dream Chaser hopefully do that someday, the, the Sierra Nevada Dream Chaser. Uh, not the beer, 
just the <laughs> the aerospace company. So the the X or the the what was I saying? Yeah, the the Dream Chaser is is designed around crew someday. Although it did not, I don't think it's ever won any contracts to actually be crewed. But they are they are finally going to be flying the Dream Chaser. It's kind of like it's similar to the X thirty seven B in in its shape. It's more of a full blown lifting body though. It's a really cool little vehicle, and that is currently scheduled to do commercial resupply missions for the next round of commercial resupply. So I think it's going to fly next year already. So I'm really excited. Um, that'll be that'll be nice. Okay, so uh, okay, uh, Philip Moyer wants to know off topic. We'll be switching over to broadcast Boca Chica testing after ULA. So what I'll do, Philip, it sounds like today they're going to be. Uh, last I checked in, I didn't actually check in this morning yet, but last I knew it sounded like they were going to be doing some kind of fuel up and and maybe a spin test this morning, and then a static fire still later today. I will be attempting to stream the static fire. Um, I'm not too worried about the anything else personally. So um, I, I just don't want to spend four or five hours sitting here <laughs> talking about uh, that. <laughs> it gets really long. Uh, so good question, Philip, but do stand by. I will post that link and, and make a big deal of it, especially on Twitter once I'm ready to go with, with the Starship testing. So uh, yeah, we will be filming that when it gets closer, especially when the hop happens. Oh, I cannot wait for that hop to happen. I hope that's not too close to DM2. That'll be a nightmare if it is. Um, Charles Roy Dubach, uh, according to you, what's the best moment of the interview you had with Elon? Um, I think the best part was was after he walked away with the mic and I realized that he still had my mic, and then he just kept talking. I think that just showed that uh, what he's talking about. And that's the, that was the most candid you know, he just kind of opened up even more at that point and just felt way more personal. Not that it wasn't that personal before, but he just, he really seemed to just have his guard down at that point. Just like, yeah. And just got, you could tell he just started talking about his rocket because he's that excited about it. And to me that, that shows, you know, when, when you, I think there's this divide sometimes where people forget that the people working on these projects really like rockets, you know, <laughs> like they're doing their job is because they love it. Um, and you can just tell Elon was so excited about Starship and you can just see his gears turning constantly throughout that interview. And I think when he came back and ended up talking for five more minutes on camera about, about it, it just shows that he, he loves it. So yeah, that's, that's what I, that's what I think, Charles. Thanks for the question. Uh, KP, KPD Warrow man. Thank you so much. You're awesome. Uh, Max Manthley, why is a vacuum Merlin overpowered though? So the Merlin engine is like, I, th I think almost 10 times more powerful. Let's look this up. Um, I'm going to do it. So um, the, the oopsies Merlin. Okay. Hold on. So the vacuum thrust, hold on. But that's, that's the vacuum. I think that's, the 1D, hang on, Merlin 1D VAC is um, pretty close in, in space, almost exactly a thousand kilonewtons or really close to a thousand kilonewtons. And the RL10, um, which, yeah, is about a hundred. So the, the Merlin is almost 10 times more powerful, which is why some of the uh, man. To look at liftoff, which occurred at okay, they're gonna do a replay here of liftoff, which I do want to see it real quick. I want to comment on, on behalf of the entire launch team. I do want to comment on how slow it moves off the pad without solid rocket boosters. Nine, it is eight, crazy. Watch this. Seven, six, five, four, three. Two, one. There's ignition. And liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket with USSF-7 for the United States Space Force on a mission dedicated to America Strong. Good. Party 180 has gone to closed loop propellant utilization control. You are hearing the voice of Rob Kesselman providing April launch vehicle gun. Send data to the HR roll. Wow. So, yeah, just did you see how slow it rolled off the, or moved off the pad? So I think their broadcast is done. So I'll just keep talking to you guys here a little bit. And I'll go ahead and pull up um, 
some of those facts that I was talking about. So, so the or the RL10, the other thing about the RL10 is it flies sometimes to get into space. So normally, you know, when a, a rocket obviously pitches over horizontal pretty quick, the whole vehicle does. You know, it goes it goes vertical. It only goes vertical to get out of the atmosphere. Like that's the whole reason a rocket ever goes vertical and to not run into like buildings and mountains and stuff, right? If there is no atmosphere, like on the moon, you could launch from the highest mountain. Uh, jump up like, I don't know, a meter and then go straight horizontal and that would get you straight into orbit and you'd stay there ish is assuming there's no external forces. Uh, but the, the thing is on earth, we have a pretty thick atmosphere. So in order to stay out of that atmosphere, you just, you go up, but then it's, you have to be going sideways, you know, 27,000 kilometers an hour, 17,500 miles an hour. You have to be going really fast horizontally in order to basically fall at the same rate as gravity is pulling you back down. So you have to be going, so just constantly falling over the freaking edge, right? Just constantly like, oh, 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 right? That's all orbiting is. Uh, so rockets go up, they get out of the atmosphere, then they turn horizontally. And normally, the, you know, it's completely horizontal within the first like two minutes of flight. And the the Atlas V booster, the first stage will fire for almost four minutes, around four minutes. And then they let go of the Centaur upper stage and the center upper stage is so underpowered with that RL-10. Um, and again, it's not necessarily underpowered. It's just a lot lower powered. It'll fly lots of times at an angle because it has to keep itself uh, aloft and not just like fall straight back down, you know? So if it, if it went like this, it'd end up re-entering. So it has to kind of fly a little bit at an angle, sometimes a more extreme angle than others. This particular mission without any solid, solid, solid rocket boosters and only going to low Earth orbit, it likely had to do that quite a bit. Obviously, the more of an angle you're at, the less you're putting into your horizontal velocity and the more you're putting into just staying, keep maintaining your altitude. So it's, uh, so yeah, it's, it's under, and in that same sense, the Merlin is so overpowered for the stage because, you know, again, the, the vehicle at that point is a very small vehicle and you have one engine. So they have to throttle it down quite a bit. It's a good thing that the, the Merlin 1D has deep throttling capabilities thanks to that Pintle injector because otherwise it would be, so sometimes when they do like an insertion burn, you, you on some of those old Starlink missions, the mission profile required a one second burn of the Merlin engine. And, you know, just going up and starting back down was like phew, phew, all these huge forces in that Merlin engine. Uh, so the reason is, yeah, it's basically 10 times more powerful. And so when your vehicle's near empty, even if you throttle it down 10%, down to 10%, which I think the Merlin can do uh, pretty deep, like 20%. That's still twice as powerful as a fully, like full bore RL-10 engine. So that's why. So it could get to the point where in some circumstances, it could almost be too powerful even to keep it under safe G-forces. But it, it isn't, but it's it's getting close to that point because you have to keep the vehicle under um, safe G-forces too. So like I said, guys, I will do some Kerbal here in a little bit. Um, I also wanted to let you guys know that I do have... Uh, some new merchandise coming out, and I'm really, really, really excited about it. This is one of the ones that I'm most excited for. This is a new Future Martian t-shirt. Uh, this is, uh, I'm getting mine this week, and they are produced now, so they're they're shipping already. But this shirt is freaking awesome. Uh, this is a new Future Martian Society t-shirt. There's uh, a pad, the kind of the thing on the front, and the, the bigger thing on the back. But what's cool about this shirt is... It has Arcadia Planitia, which is the actual prime landing site currently for uh, NASA and Starship has talked about um, using Arcadia Planitia. And then those exact coordinates are the prime A candidate landing site for the first Starship mission. I just thought that was kind of cool. And then on the sleeve, it does have uh, some of the uh, specs about Mars, so the, the gravity, the atmosphere composition. Uh, and then it says not suitable for EVA use, life support required, which is just kind of fun. But then we also have a nod to uh, the the old school patch, the old school logo. Uh, people have been asking to have something, they like things on their back. So this is another shirt that has another big thing on the back. So it'll be really cool and has uh, Everyday Astronaut bringing space down to Earth for everyday people on the front. Just kind of a cool shirt. And then um, we also do now have a three pack of masks because you guys were asking for different because some, you know, legally, a lot of people are required to wear cloth masks. You notice that ULA was doing that. So we do have three different space-themed masks. We have um, the warning label from the hatch on the International Space Station, which says failure to equalize pressure before unlatching can result in crew injury and equipment damage. That's this one. Um, we also have a normal mask. We also have do not open except for 
<laughs> for use uh, or inspection, cleaned for pressurization services. These were just like fun, different little aerospace little nods that we thought would be kind of a fun way since we're all having to wear masks these days. Kind of a fun way to, uh, yeah, to have some identity still and a, and a little bit of fun with it. So you can buy these either in a three pack or just as a single mask as well. So um, there's a discount when you buy all three. Or if you work in the aerospace industry, you can take 50% off by clicking here and submitting your aerospace uh, industry email. But yeah, so if you guys want to help support what I do, head on over to everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Uh, again, check out everydayastronaut.com slash shop. And uh, while this is, I'll keep answering guys' questions and I'll start firing up Kerbal as well. Because I think I think that'll be fun. I, we definitely need to make a Kerbal space, a, a X-37 space plane, right? I feel like that's... Um, obviously, obviously necessary. Hold on. Give me a second. I can't do like two things at once. I'm not that talented. Come on, guys. Um, I'm gonna get that baby fired up. Meanwhile, okay, so, oh, one second here. We've got to put Kerbal on the right screen. We don't want it on the wrong screen. That'd be silly. Where are you going, buddy? Come here. Okay, Kerbal's ready to go. Or will be ready to go in a second. While it's firing up, I will answer more of your questions here. So, uh, Max, hopefully that, that answers your questions about why the, the vacuum Merlin is overpowered. Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, Daniel, how are you? Thank you for the membership. Uh, Kikard Production Australia, thank you for an enjoyable launch and a good night from Sydney, Australia. Cheers, David. Well, thanks, David. Um, have a wonderful evening. Thank you for tuning in down there where it's already night and it's just now morning here. Crazy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Randy, uh, you need Ben's auto-tune when you say our ludicrous future. Yes, I do. I should get whatever plugin he's using for his uh, for his stream deck because that's what he's using. I That'd be pretty funny. <laughs> Thanks, Randy. Big T, how is SpaceX going to deal with the cleaning for Starship for Mars? NASA has standards to land on other planets to not bring organisms. Boca, <laughs> Boca Starship also do an F-111 Australian loved jet and Kerbal, maybe. Uh, the F-111, oh yeah, yeah. Um, we'll see how much time we end up having. Wait, are there, is there a crane thing now? Like a cable? Is that a cable? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Loopy or someone that is big Kerbal, is there a crane, like cable in the robotics now? Someone please let me know. Um... Please let me know. That is that would be like the coolest thing ever. Why is this showing up? Hold on. I gotta just make sure that it just looks weird. Whatever. Um, I'll get this fired up here. Uh, yeah. So how will they keep Starship clean? So for the m yeah. I honestly I think when you it's to enter Mars's atmosphere, you end up getting really 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 hot. And I'm trying to figure out if, uh, if that on its own would burn off any microorganisms. But I don't know. That's actually a really good question. I think once humans land on Mars, I don't think there's too much we can do in terms of planetary protection. But that is a very good question, and I'm not entirely sure what they're going to do about it, frankly. So I'm sorry that I don't really have the answer. I have not heard the answer, though. Um, but that's, that is a very valid question. Um, yeah. So big T I'll see if I can find that answer in the near future. And did somebody, um, loopy, it didn't look like a, a hinge or a piston. It really did look like a cable pulling out. It was on a, a robotic arm. Hmm. I had never seen that before. Um, and then ice fire. So could you hit a big jump on top of a mountain going really fast and a Tesla on the moon and achieve orbit? Of course you could. If you, if you could get uh, on the moon, I think you need what, like two thousand kilometers, a set or two thousand meters per second, uh, two kilometers a second, something like that. It's not very fast to orbit the moon. Well, relative, uh, but the cool thing about the moon, so like a, a gravity or some kind of you know maglev type of thing would be a really very easily achievable on the moon. The the problem, so you couldn't get into orbit necessarily from a ramp because what you'll happen. <laughs> You have to be, if you're going up like that, it'll be basically come back down around and it wouldn't give you enough horizontal velocity. I could show you in Kerbal actually, but re realistically what you need is you need to go horizontally really, really fast until the point where like your wheels just stop touching the ground basically. 
Um, um, yeah, it was on the loading screen. Okay. But so on the moon, you could have kind of like a maglev type of situation that, that could get you most of the way into orbit. And then once you reach apogee from there, you could just fire a little bit to circularize. Uh, it'd be relatively easy. It'd be easy, way easier than down here on earth. Cause you don't have to contend with the atmosphere. So yeah. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, you would have to go fast though. But the cool thing is without air resistance, an electric car could go really, 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 really fast. You know, all you're worried about is friction, is, is the road friction, the, the tires to the, to the whatever surface it's touching is the only real resistance you're going to have. So an uh, electric car could go extremely fast. Okay, so let me pull up Kerbal here for you guys. Um, let's see, where do I want this? Yeah, I want that up there, that's fine. Uh, but later in the thing, I'll forget, and we want it there. Okay, uh, and let me finish here. So, Matthew Duggar, thank you for streaming. Re remember to hydrate. Thank you, Matthew. <laughs> uh, Captain Curry, hey, I want the new Mars logo on Apollo. Uh, yes, we will. That's a good idea. Well, I know, Captain we're, uh, Kurt, we're also working on uh, proper, like, button-ups and stuff like that, too. We actually have a new uh, relationship with a proper cut-and-sew custom shop, and that is something we are actively pursuing and working on it got a little bit sidetracked because of the whole uh pandemic thing but that is something that we are working on is some dress shirts which are very commonly requested mostly from you <laughs> so I'll, I'll take care of that don't you worry uh simon isn't it nominal without the r um so simon yes let me show you why it's nominal, at least in our shop so this is all a thing um, it was on July 5th, 2017, SpaceX principal integration engineer John Innsbrucker accidentally said the word nominal, which is a mixture between normal and nominal. So it's kind of like this inside joke in the industry, and it's kind of become a thing. Nominal. Everything's nominal. Yeah, so it's just kind of like a funny, funny joke. So, yeah, very funny joke. Obviously hilarious. Clearly so funny. <laughs> there you go. That's... That's why um, you don't need to frown about it, Simon. Um, otherwise, it would be sad, but it's funny. So you can change that uh, to a huh. rough rider show. Tim, SpaceX is going to have a very fast turnaround for the drone ship. Of course, I still love you. Starlink on the 19th and DM2 on the 27th. Do you think SpaceX can finish Starlink and turn around? Of course, I still love you, the, the drone ship, in time for DM2. Well, they're going to need to. Um, that is actually a good question. That will be a very tight turnaround. They do have two drone ships, but I think Just Read the Instructions is currently undergoing upgrades. So, yeah, that's, that is, uh, yeah, that's going to be a tight turnaround. But I think they can. I mean, that's still, what, eight days? It takes about three days to get out there. Starlink missions are pretty far downrange. Yeah. Good call, though. I think it'll be a very tight turnaround, so we'll see. They'll be pushing it. And Christian, hello from South Africa. Thanks for always streaming. You're welcome. Thank you for tuning in. Okay, so let's throw together a really quick X-37B. I'm going to be looking at one here for a second, um, just so I'm not, like, totally wrong about the proportions and things. I think that would be a good idea. I will kind of be looking at one over on this screen so the first thing that we're going to need, ah, the front's going to be, honestly, the hardest thing to replicate in Kerbal Space Program. Uh, but let's just kind of throw it together, a probe, get a little, some kind of front nose cone that's pretty nubby, like this. Make it black. That's about right. And then what we can do is... You know what would, would make the most sense for the payload bay would be that MK2 payload bay. But that MK2 payload bay is is the wrong shape. But we can still use it. We'll just offset some stuff. Man, that shape's actually going to be fairly hard to make. It'd actually be really easy if we made it big, space shuttle sized. I know this is kind of cheating. Let's do that. That'll be way easier. So what we're going to do, I'll still use this actually. And then we're going to grab, uh, let me think about this. Let me just make, start with a payload bay. So kind of know, make sure it's on the top side of it. There we go. And then assuming I can still connect one of these guys to it. 
Uh, and actually, we could do like this. So this is going to be oversized. It's not to scale. Well, it, not really to scale, but whatever. <laughs> It'll be good enough. So then the hard part is going to be, how do we round this baby off? Nope. They changed so many things. Nope. Let's see here. Let me mute that. Um, what is the right nose cone for the? These are way too very small and tiny. I don't think those are gonna cut it. Uh, for those of you wondering, there it is. But that can we go black with that yet? No, that looks really dumb too. Not a fan of that. What is gonna be the best way to do this? Um. Hang on, let me let me keep thinking. Let me use try to use my brain for a second, which is sometimes very difficult for me to do. That looks really dumb. That looks even dumber. Let's see. What is the best way to give it that nub nose? Cause that's gonna be the hard part. The old nub nose. Nub nose, no. We want a nub nose, Tim. What I could maybe just do would be throw on a little fairing like this, and that'll be the closest thing to a little nub nose. I don't know. That looks absolutely horrendous, but it's maybe the best we can do. Um, let me just kind of push this in. There we go. That's looking better. Oopsies, what's happening? I've never had that happen before. Okay. Yeah, that, that'll work-ish. Ish. I mean, like I said, it won't be very attractive, but that's close enough. Uh, wow, shortest turnaround time for, <laughs> for of course, I still love you, is eight days. So they're going to be pushing it. Oh, that's awesome. Luke Pr uh, Prail says, what's your favorite coffee shop in Cedar Falls? My family lives there, so I know a lot of them. My favorite is Sidecar Coffee on College Hill. That is uh, my favorite coffee shop. And uh, I might be a little biased because it is a really good friend of mine's coffee shop. It's like one of my best friend's coffee shops. So, But it's also the best coffee for me. So I love their cappuccinos personally. I have had a cappuccino almost every day of my life <laughs> from there. Uh, yeah, that's definitely my favorite. What's your favorite? Let me ask you that. What's your favorite? And why is it Sidecar Coffee? Uh, let's see. That looks a little too big. There is one more Delta Wing. There's the small, there's the big, and there's like a normal Delta Wing. We'll probably have to use the normal one. Not structural, not that small, and I already clicked on that. Isn't there one more in between? We can't just go from monster to not monster. There we go, delta wing. Knew it. And these wings are mounted down low like this. They're horizontal. We could give them a little bit of dihedral roll to them, like a dihedral angle. <laughs> uh, okay, so that looks about right. Now the trick with a, with a space plane or with any vehicle is once we kind of get it all together, we do need to make sure the center of lift is behind the center of mass. That will allow it to fly pretty well. And it does get it does taper up again. So just to do that, I might. Oh, this is, this would be cool actually. Hang on. Let's use a smaller, the smallest one of the. Like this, and then this, because that's actually about right. It kind of does that. And then let's do a small, uh, a small big tank, <laughs> as they say. Like this? No, that's too big. Where is that? Everything's so out of order from these days. I just don't even know anymore. There we go. Okay, that's about right. And then. The wings are just above that taper, so around here-ish. Like I said, we'll fix that angle. Something about like that for now. 
And then it has two pretty large, uh, they're not vertical stabilizers-ish, because they also act as the uh, horizontal, or the actual, like, elevators in the back. Tail stable, whatever you'd call that. What would you call that? Let's see, but these are kind of just straight. Those aren't quite big enough. We need something a little bit bigger and beefier. But being as they're almost totally straight, actually, something like these might be a decent fit. I know this looks silly, and it's not quite the way that they're meant to be used, but it's Kerbal Space Program. We can do whatever we want. There we go. Okay, we'll do those, and then we'll also put some of these here. That should be about all we need for control services. And then these can just tuck in a little bit because they are... There we go. Uh, rudder Vaders. Thank you, Loopy. I did not know that they had a little name. Rudder Vaders. Now you know. Um... Uh... <laughs> So Adam says, will the UK ever launch a rocket? Yeah, the UK is working on, what's that one called? The, um, it's pretty new, but it's only like a little electron looking rocket. It's very, very, very similar to the electron, but I cannot remember what it's called. Orbex, thank you, Techfin. I, that's what I was thinking actually, but I was so nervous I was gonna be totally wrong. But yeah, Orbex is a cool little launcher that the, that the, the UK is currently working on. So absolutely. And Skyrora. I did not know about Skyrora. I have never heard that in my life. Um, one of the things we need to do, though, with this is it has two attachment nodes, or wood. It kind of has an offset. You'll see why we're doing this. Um, we are going to give it this kind. And then, because it really just has a single engine pointing through the center of mass like this. And here's what we need to do is make sure our engine is pointing through the center of mass. About like that. But it is offset. It's offset a fair amount. And then this thing's going to need an awful lot of RCS to probably maintain any kind of <laughs> decency. Are you learning over there, Jelly Dude? Hopefully this is going to help your Kerbal game. Three, four. Uh, one of the things that's nice for RCS that I like to do is also make some, make a set of roll. So I go like this, copy them like this. That way the vehicle can roll. I, I'd want to put those closer to the center, honestly. That will help make that roll a little more reasonable. But all I did is I... I Oh, that's so weird when it does that. I'll put them up here so you can see them from all four sides. But all I did is I, I turned them 90 degrees, and that way we can provide roll control for the vehicle. But now we have our pitch yaw roll on all angles, and then we'll also add like four thrusters down here to the very bottom. Hold on. <laughs> there we go. Jeez. And push these in. Something about like that, because there would be some there. There would also likely be some up top as well. That would be pointing uh, kind of inward. And then once we have this, there we go. We'll just kind of put these, what would be in the nose cone-ish. Something about like this. Oh, poop. I really don't want those off angle. That look really silly. Push these babies up. Push them in there. Put them in the nose cone. Looking for a friend. Hmm. That is not great at all. Why is it floating? Um, Skyrora were interviewed on tomorrow or so. Okay, yeah. If you guys, so if you want to learn about Skyrora, definitely go to tomorrow, T-M-R-O, here on YouTube. They would be able to provide you with a lot of good information because apparently they interviewed, oh, this is weird. Apparently they interviewed 
Skyrora last year. So that would be a good way to learn more about a company that I don't know anything about. So I'm just going to kind of push these in just so they don't look totally ridiculous. But there you go. There's our... <laughs> I hate this. It looks so dumb when you do that, but whatever. We'll angle them a little bit so they don't totally bug my OCD. Okay. And then we will also do a battery pack. It also has a giant solar panel that comes out of the side. <sighs> We could, I mean, if we want to do this right, we'd need to have like, you know what? We're just going to do one and we will just do this, mount it here. We'll mount it right here. That's what we're going to do. Good enough. This will just come out like this and power it in space. Ta-da. Good enough. Yeah, this is definitely oversized. This is way too big of a scale for the vehicle, but at least it's in scale. So it's reasonable. It has a tiny little landing gear, I feel like. Let me look at the picture again. And then two tiny little landing gears over here. Something about like this. Now the key is when it re-enters, you need to make sure that this, you need to empty the tanks before you finalize the placement of the wings. That's gonna be one of your biggest key issues is going to be um, where you put the wings in relative to the rest of the vehicle when it's empty, because obviously, you know, you'd want to use up all your fuel and space, blah, blah, blah. So let's empty out the tanks here quick, get a good sense for what this vehicle would be like on re-entry. And then what we can do is we can turn on the aerodynamics and look, notice that the aerodynamics are uh, behind the center of mass. That's very good, but they're actually maybe a little bit too far behind. If you put them too far behind, you have a hard time, uh, actually doing that and i'm afraid this won't have very much lift to begin with so i am going to push it all a little bit forward i also want to clip this in a little bit it's a little bit too long for my liking i hate when kerbal does that though i wish you would just choose one of the layers when you clip like that okay what do you guys think that's probably close enough yeah that's probably close enough So there you go. Yeah, it's kind of like the X37C. So uh, Jelly Dude, Tim, this is a suggestion for new merch, adding the For All Mankind intro logo and the Everyday Astronaut logo together. Um, I mean, there's a thing called copyrights. I can't just take someone else's logo and stick it on my own merch. Uh, but if they wanted to do something like that, I would consider it. But I also like just, I don't know, I don't really like having to rely on somebody else's uh, branding like that. But yeah, that, um, <laughs> I mean, I, I could just start being like, yeah, this is, you made this, I made this. So this is pretty much going to be an X37B-ish. I feel like it lands on teeny tiny little wheels. Hopefully it's not going to totally overwhelm the <laughs> landing gear. Those look so small and I'm so scared. Okay. So I think this is good enough to good enough to try. I'm going to keep this empty because we, it, I don't know, we don't need nearly that much fuel. We are going to load it up down here, though, to at least help get itself. How much is that's going to be way too much? 3000 meters per second of Delta V just so we can land somewhere near empty. I'm actually going to fly this thing almost empty because it has way too much capability even with just half of that it has that much jeez what the heck okay good enough good enough okay so then what we need to do is we need to stick this baby inside of uh we're gonna do a centaur style upper stage so that will can be 2.5 meters in kerbal we'll do something like this is that 2.5 We'll do a bigger one like this. 2.5 and a, let's see. Where's that one engine? I know this isn't quite scale to the vehicle. We'll make it scale to the vehicle, but good enough. 
Okay, so this is kind of like our centaur. And then the weird thing about uh, the Atlas V uh, with the five meter fairing is that the upper stages inside the payload fairing, uh, period, <laughs> which is super different. Okay, so we'll go like this, get this baby ready to go. We want to make sure these are on the right staging, which would be, get out of here. Well, which will put this up there. We're also going to make it so we can't accidentally stage this. Fairing, we do not want you staged. Okay, then all of this needs to fit inside of a massive five meter. So I guess this actually is to scale-ish. The problem is, is that uh, Kerbal's so small. Oh, we're a little too small. Kerbal's so small that we're flying an Earth-style rocket on Kerbal, which is just not really necessary. Okay, there is our mat. This is going to have a hard time staying together, I'll tell you that. Uh, let me make sure to auto strut some stuff because it's going to be a wiggly wobbly little beast. Basically going to have to auto strut everything. One, two, three. I like to do auto strutting to the grandparent part. I find it better than like the heaviest part. Kerbal seems to like it a little bit better. Okay, that should be good enough. And maybe a little bit of this. Okay, I know those wings have a little bit of a dihedral angle, but it looks good. Okay, so now we've got... Okay, that makes sense. Now we just need our, our Atlas, or our Centaur, or wait, yeah, our Atlas booster. And we'll just use, again, this is not at all to scale. <laughs> use an Atlas booster is not five meters wide. But we needed the five meter wide fairing. Hmm, this is this is wonky. I just realized that we should have gone three points, whatever. Whatever, I don't care. Again, we're just doing it. We're mostly just trying to get the, the stupid thing into space quick. And this is going to be total overkill. Like, very, very, very overkill. And <laughs> Again, because we, we use parts that... Oh, man. I hate that we had to use those parts. Whoops. Whoops. Yeah, for those of you tuning in now, the launch already happened, and we're just trying to rebuild it in Kerbal Space Program. This is not the secret space plane <laughs> anymore. This is just Kerbal Space Program. Uh, I'm not trying to mislead you. You're, you just missed it because it already happened. Um, so we could go like this, two attachments. Let's see if those, if these two guys, I don't know if there are two engines powerful enough to lift this thing on its own. Even the, wait, that's not the right one. I don't know if this will be, oh my word. Yeah, thrust to weight ratio way too low. So we can just empty a tank. <laughs> Like we'll we'll basically empty this tank. Still too low. <laughs> oh man. I think that's the most powerful engine in Kerbal, isn't it? See, there we go. That's what NASA should have done for the vehicle. That's so much cooler. Uh you're exactly right, Dustin. Dang it. Okay, so I don't know how we're going to do this. We don't have engines powerful enough to lift this thing for only two. Uh, Samir, do you see NASA in future employing smart reuse for SLS's R25 once it's successfully demonstrated by ULA? I do not think that will happen. Uh, the SLS is not going to go into further development. And the core stage totally depletes itself. So there, the core stage and smart reuse only makes sense if there's fuel left over. The core stage is completely drained every every flight. There's no residual fuel left over. So I, I cannot see that happening. And I'm, frankly, I think there should be not any at all any more 
development of that vehicle. Um, full stop. That's my opinion. So yeah, good question though, Samir. And Marcus, can you make the nose red? You cannot, uh, with stock Kerbal, you cannot change the colors really of anything. Uh, very, very little color options. There's a few. Okay, so we need to figure out how we're going to make the engines powerful enough to lift this thing. We might just have to break free from our keeping the heritage anywhere near. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to try something a little different. I'm going to do the 3.7 meter wide fairing and keep the whole thing 3.7 meters wide. Probably going to be close to maxing out this fairing in order to fit the wings in. That's about right. Uh, and the Atlas V nose kind of tapers early. Oh, oops, that's likely. Okay, oh, the other thing we need to do is clamshell deploy so it looks the part. Only two sides, please. Please make that default Kerbal. That's what it should be. Clamshell. Always clamshell. Okay, now we'll go 3.75 wide tank. That'll help us. Which is this style? No. I always forget. That's this guy. Oh, yeah. And this is our main stage now. So two of these. Sure. Just so it doesn't look super repetitive, we'll do this. Okay. Now we have left less to lift, so let's try um, even like this. I think two of those big engines is way too underpowered still, which is scary, but we can try. <laughs> that looks really dumb. Oh, there we go. Huh. Would you look at that? We have a high enough thrust to weight ratio. Okay, we can try this now. One, two, three. Okay, so this, for again, for those of you, if you just happen to be tuning in now, this is what we just saw launch about an hour ago. There's a X-37B space plane with its wings, with its, hopefully not, hopefully not these things deployed. Uh, start retracted, please. Thank you. Start retracted, please. Thank you. Okay, uh, Philip Moyer, Reed, didn't, or SLS didn't con Congress tie funding for Europa Clipper to the SLS if we, uh, if we want EC, which we do, ha we have to use, SLS. yes, that is, my current understanding is uh, there's still, they looked at commercial options, but I think it is still written into congressional law that the SLS needs to be used for Europa Clipper, which is pretty crazy. Oh, Andy wants to know some if we can play some music. We can play some music. We'll play some copyright flea, flea music. <laughs> Wonder what that's going to be. Weird. Every new astronaut. Uh, I don't know. I don't know where we're going to find this. Okay. Let me know if the volume's okay. Hang on. Okay. Um, if rockets are cold, how are how is crew safe? That's a good question. There's a good amount of space between the crew and the fuel tanks. So the fuel tanks are the parts that are really cold, and then you can keep heaters and things like that on for the inside of the crew cabin. Is that okay, volume? Let me let me know, guys. Okay, let's let's give this a, a try here. Um, OTV six X thirty seven B. Okay. Why don't they launch rockets in cold temps? Because now you have another variable, and the the difference between like you know, say twenty degrees Celsius and fifteen degrees Celsius compared to minus two hundred degrees Celsius is negligible. So you really just. <laughs> Okay, so we curbled this rocket really, really, really hard. But let's go. Three, two, one, hip, hip. Here you go. This is your Atlas V, 501 with an, 
with an oversized X37B in it. This is about as cartoonized as we can get, so. Well, they can launch in cold temps, but they, were you asking why don't they launch in cold temps um, to like try to keep the fuel from boiling off, or just why don't they launch them in cold temps, period? I think the big reason that they don't launch in cold temps in, in Florida is because it's often cold, and there's rarely cold in Florida. Uh, obviously, the Challenger taught us that it, it can be, um, that it can be cold because it reached below freezing the morning of the Challenger, which ended up breaking those those O-rings between the, the segments of the solid rocket booster. Okay, so we're going to be very careful with this. But I think other rockets would be able to handle much more cold temperatures. I think solid rocket boosters have a little bit of an exemption to that rule. Okay. So now that we're kind of getting up there, we're going to do a slow gravity turn because when you have this big of a payload fairing, I don't really want it to go too quickly. Like I said, this is extremely cartoonized, but hopefully this will be good enough here, Jelly Dude, to be able to get your X-37B working. I have no idea if we... We probably should have done like a flight test of it before we just launched it, but whatever. Too late. I do like now in Kerbal, you can go down here to the man, uh, maneuver node and you can actually get a sense of your <laughs> your orbit while you're flying. That's very, very nice. Okay, so we're going to keep turning a little bit, increasing our gravity turn here. And if we're going to do this anything like, um, oh, we don't need that naughty. Okay, whatever. I guess we could just in case that does something. I am going to jettison the nose cone here in a second just to try to keep it, well, I'll throttle down. Let's jettison the nose cone after the, we'll call this max Q because obviously we're experiencing some aerodynamic forces. But we're going to keep going here and we're going to jettison the fairing while the first stage is burning just like the Atlas V. So here we go, three, two, one. Uh-oh. So we had a little minor explosion. Don't know what that was, but everything's fine. I think. I seem to have lost control of the lower stage. I did. I lost control of the lower stage, so we lost a decoupler there. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and fire up the upper stage here and get out of here. There we go. It wouldn't be Kerbal Space Program if you didn't have some kind of antics like this, right? Okay, so now we're going to turn on our RCS so we can do things like a roll program. See, good thing I put those roll thrusters on there. So we have roll authority. Okay, so we need to... This is going to be about right, actually. <laughs> to the de decoupler, everybody. So yeah, we're, we're getting ourselves into orbit now. This is something you can see here. The faster we go, the more and more uh, this is going to be spreading out here. So we're trying to not raise our apoapsis too much. If we, if we kind of kept our head above, uh, our nose above the horizon, which we are not, you can see I'm actually pointing down a little bit. I'm doing that to try to keep our apoapsis fairly similar here, but we're speeding up, which is making it so we're going to be missing, eventually missing the Earth, or Kerbin at this point. And yeah, so we're now putting ourselves into orbit, no big deal. Uh, it did launch. It launched already this morning, and now we're uh, recreating it in Kerbal Space Program by request, because uh, Jelly Dude was uh, unable to make an X-37B work in Kerbal Space Program. So hopefully we can get this to work. I don't see the... My my biggest concern with, uh, with this not working is actually uh, that we don't have big enough wings and that our glide ratio is going to be terrible. But we are going to basically empty it. Um, let's see here. I'm gonna, we do have one more burn to do, but whatever. 
Uh, Unoridi, Unoridin four year programmer. You, un, sure. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Tim. Do you think SpaceX and Blue Origin will put ULA out of business eventually? I think it'll be a while before ULA. Because don't forget, their Vulcan rocket is actually going to be very cost cost effective. I think that as reuse becomes more and more, I will go ahead and say that I'll, I'll use the word figured out. Um, then I, at that point, I, I do think it'll be really, really, really hard for ULA to compete if they don't start to utilize reuse in some of their systems. Because, but they are, they're, they're working on it. Vulcan will have smart reuse and aces, which could reuse upper stages, which could be, uh, in space, you reuse upper stages, which could be a really big deal for certain missions. So I think they're making the right steps. I personally wish they had been a little more aggressive with some of the steps, but they aren't really, that's not really their thing. You know, they're a pretty conservative, slow to, slow to kind of make big changes company. So I think they're playing their, their moves right to not lose any of their government contracts and, and defense contracts. Okay, so we are now in a good enough orbit. I'm going to go ahead and detach our Centaur upper stage. And now you can see we are free flying with our with our space plane. And just while so we don't accidentally forget and run out of electricity. I'll do this right away. And also to make sure we catch enough sunlight, I'll turn it that way. There we go. Okay. We are in space with our space plane, the X-37B. Um, but yeah, the and the and like Loopy mentions in our uh, in our Discord channel that Vulcan is basically ready. It's essentially built. I mean, it literally is pretty much ready to go. They're at this point. They're pretty much waiting for the BE-4 to be ready. Which is what, uh, you know, don't forget they're buying engines from Blue Origin. The BE-4 engine will be powering the Vulcan, which is cool. Okay, so. Let's go ahead and fire up our offset engine. Our little on-space maneuvering engine. See if that actually works, even though it's offset. I'm going to go up to our, our apolapse. It's our highest point. Raise the orbit. Okay, so I'm gonna flip around here quick. Raise our orbit, just to say we did it. Testing out our, our main little engine. It's able to hold pretty good there, even though it's offset. So you angle it in, you angle it towards the center of mass, and then using a little bit of, you know, using the gimbal obviously, and here we can see what the, oopsies, what the thing is doing. It's not having to do much, honestly. What if we turn off RCS? Can it still hold? Pretty good, actually. So that's how much it's having to offset beyond that even. So it is gimbling quite a bit in order to maintain heading. Okay, how are we doing here? Probably good enough. There we go, about, about 300 by 300. Good enough. Okay, so now we want to land back here. This is going to be the this the scary part. Can this vehicle re-enter and land? And hopefully we burnt off enough of our fuel. We're pretty empty, so that's good. Oh, I should have put those drain valves on. I forgot that's a thing now. Um, Big T, are you not from I did a I did a video with Matt Lown. Or Lone, I never remember how to pronounce it. Is it Lone or Lown? Matt Lone, I think it's just Lone. Anyway, I did a, I did a thing with him. I did a, I did a, I did a thing. We did a video together. I, I sent a Saturn V, the whole vehicle to the moon uh, by accident. And then he was supposed to return it and it kept blowing up whenever it would load up. So yeah, I, I love Matt, Matt, however you pronounce it, Lone. Lown, but I love Matt. It's Lone, not Lone. <laughs> Spelled the same. Uh, Lown. Sure. Big D, a follow-up. 
Can you make a video on how SpaceX will land a Starship on Mars? Will it be in NASA's standards for clean? Mars rovers go through a spray down of alcohol rub, and they also bake them oftentimes. Would be an interesting video with Elon. That is something I would like to ask him about next time I'm able to interview the guy. It would be just kind of like planetary protection. Can you clean up Starship enough? Yeah, to really be able to do that. Oh, I feel like uh, I keep, I always look at the, the Discord channel often. Uh, if you guys do want to join our Discord channel and talk with other awesome space geeks like me, uh, go to patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. You can join access to our Discord channel, our subreddit, and just a uh, place of awesomeness. So, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and try and re-enter here from a pretty high orbit, relatively high orbit. And I have no idea, so I'm just going to quick save here in case I totally bork this. But I'm thinking from here... Huh, our periapsis is almost on the exact opposite side. So I'll have to bring this way down. So we're going to bring... Like, this will have to be like 20 or so. Actually, I could... This to just slightly push this out a little, ever so slightly. There we go. Give ourselves more time in the atmosphere. So we still wouldn't even, at this point, we'd totally miss it. <laughs> still would totally miss it. We'd fly right overhead. So this is the landing strip here. Uh, 50. So, even if this is touching the ground, we likely wouldn't even be hitting the atmosphere at this point yet. So, I am going to go ahead and let that be the case. Something about like this. Quick save. Okay, let's see if our X-37B is good for re-entry. I have no idea. I have no idea if... if if we built this right, I know uh, Jelly Dude was unable to get his to work, so let's see if we built one that is anywhere close to working. Like I said, my biggest fear is that we just simply do not have enough aerodynamic lift. But only one way to find out. Good thing we have... Uh, we just want our authority all the way cranked, probably. I might be coming in short, actually. Yeah, I'm gonna increase a little bit here while we're out here like this. So we don't wanna be short. Something about like this, though. Whoa, we're raising our periapsis. So it actually is providing some decent lift, unless I left the engines on. That's cool. So if we hit F12, oh, I hate that. I forget that I have that option on right now on Steam. I do not want that. Preferences, never take a screenshot when I hit F12. How do I change that? In-game. Um... Yeah, no, no, no. There we go. That'll never happen again. Okay. So our periapsis is now going down, finally. It is holding its attitude very, very well, though. Famous last words. As a matter of fact, this might actually be a little bit too strong. Okay. Everything's looking good. I'll go ahead and hide those arrow forces. I said no! I said no to the screenshot. Why is it doing that? Alright. This is looking pretty good. I might actually need to... 
get a little more aggressive with our arrow breaking. Cool, we're going up, actually. That's awesome. So this does have a decent amount of, of body lift, which is good. Let's slow her down. Actually, we should probably probably be going down. I'm going to go ahead and roll it like this. It's a very spicy maneuver, but let's get down into the thicker parts of the atmosphere. There we go. Okay, so this does seem to have a decent amount of lift, actually, and a decent amount of control. So we're doing this so we can try to line up a little bit better with the runway. Now we don't want to fall short, so we're basically just going to try to hold our heading. Sweet. Does look like we're a little bit to the right, so I'm going to just push a tiny bit this way. Now, now that we're in pretty low atmosphere, we're going to start slowing down pretty fast here. And if not, we can perform a couple S turns to slow down even more. Um, something about like this. I think me using these RCS thrusters might be... Let's see how it flies without them. It flies okay. Doesn't fly as well without them, though. I will tell you that. Okay, so we need to get... We need to get lower very quickly, so let's go ahead and do this. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> Let's try to get back under control now. That was a huge mistake. But we recovered. We're just testing it to the limits, you know. Jeez. <laughs> oh. Hey, look, it's all working out okay. We're on a decent final approach, actually. Meant to do that. That was the normal. The normal, you know, they, they call it the old flim flam. You just gotta like that. It's not a big deal. It's just what the it's just what the vehicle likes to do. We designed it that way. Don't worry about it. We are almost out of RCS though, so we're gonna turn it off in case we need it for the last second. <laughs> oh, are we gonna have enough glide ratio? It flies okay, actually. We very well might be coming up short. After that wacky maneuver. Uh, that wacky maneuver might may have done us in. But if we land on the on the lighter green grass, that'd be nice, because it's a little smoother. Anywhere on the light green grass would be a total win. But who knows at this point? Uh, Lachlan says, hey, Tim, I love hanging out on your stream. Thank you. Uh, a quick question. Do you know why SpaceX changed Crew Dragon Super Draco heat shielding to silver from black? I don't know off the top of my head, but I wouldn't be surprised if it simply had to do with thermal management on orbit. Um, black is, is a very big heat absorber. So I'm guessing that they just had to paint it a different color uh, while on orbit so it doesn't receive too much heating um, or something, some kind of thermal consideration. But I don't actually know why. Uh, Jelly Dude, thank you for the help. Learned a lot. Hard to make changes with the X-37B. Question, why when I re-enter does it goes wobbly uh, every space plane on KSP? Um, again, making sure that you have um, your center of lift behind your center of mass when empty. So make sure you're... you're flying or you know you're you're looking at how it's going to be when empty when you're designing it that way when you re-enter and you've spent all your fuel done all your stuff you are ready to go for re-entry and 
uh, especially for your entry, having your, your center of mass a ways behind your center of, of gravity, uh, or your center of lift behind your center of mass will really help it maintain stability through re-entry. And then also using uh, RCS, having enough RCS on helps a lot too, so. F-111 jet launched on a Delta. <laughs> you want me to do that? Oh. Uh, I don't think we'll be doing that. But Jelly Dude, hopefully this is working out for you. Hopefully you learned enough to, to make it to make it happen. Um, and Big T, I think this will be the end of the stream once we land this thing. Assuming we land it. I'm going to go ahead and extend the, land, the tiny little landing gear. This looks quite a bit... I'm actually kind of impressed. Oh, I'm nervous though that we are... I might toot the engine for just a second and try to get us a little bit further. It's not doing much, but it'll help. I do not recommend firing your vacuum engine uh, <laughs> at sea level. Just highly unrecommend that. But here we go. If we, like I said, if we can land kind of in the lime green... Okay, okay, okay. We're gonna try to speed up here. We gotta have some velocity. Checking our flare. I should probably make sure this is also ground so I have an idea of when to flare. Hey, light, light green. We made it to the light green. Now just nice and easy, nice and easy. I thought for sure this was going to blow up. Okay, so we were short. But we landed. To my absolute shock and awe, we landed. On the light green even. That's that's a good enough win for just a first general test flight. We could deploy these. That'd be kind of cool. As air brakes. Check that out. Maybe deploy these. Sweet. That's kind of cool. There we go. That's how you make an X-37B. Only you keep it up there for two years, and then you do that. That is how you do it. Cool. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, that's going to do it for me now. Like I said, hopefully later on today, I will be able to do... Uh, well, if they do go for a static fire out of Boca Chica today, not just the like spin test or anything like that um if they do a static fire today i will be tuning in for that and streaming myself so so pay so pay attention i'll hopefully be streaming later tonight then um <laughs> and who says you keep it up there as long as it takes <laughs> thomas says you were short because distance to runway was displayed as kilometers but was actually miles uh, did you guys watch? I just put it, put out a video on Thursday. Uh, it's the story about how NASA and Lockheed Martin mixed up um, metric and, and imperial. I thought I knew the story. Like going into it, I, I thought it was going to be a really quick video. Like I thought it was going to take me a week instead it took me two weeks. Because there's a lot more to that story than I thought. It's not just as simple as, oh, they accidentally wrote miles and kilometers, as, as Thomas was joking. Uh, but... There's a lot to that story. It was a really fun topic, actually. So if you haven't watched that video, definitely check out that video um, talking about NASA, NASA mixing up Imperial and Metric for uh, the Mars Climate Orbiter. That is really fun. But again, join me in a little bit here, guys. I will be hopefully live streaming tonight. Uh, but meanwhile, don't forget, if you want to help support what I do, everydayastronaut.com slash shop is probably the most fun way to do that. You can pick up some merch for yourself. And, uh, and also, like I said... Uh, patreon.com slash everyday astronaut if you want to join our exclusive discord channel or our subreddit and all those other things and i'll also be going down to dm2 so wish me luck on that guys uh like i said i'll be taking extreme precaution and being as safe as i can possibly be but yeah that's gonna do it for me guys um thank you guys so much for joining me but i'll hopefully be on later tonight and i'll also be on for starlink in a few days as well so uh, and meanwhile, I'm also going to be working on part two of the kind of SLS versus uh, Starship. But part two is kind of changed now after uh, I had to retweak it. Part two now is going to be 
more um, Artemis versus Apollo, actually. So that's changed quite a bit. And we're going to compare how these missions, the, to get the true costs of SLS and everything, the true costs of the Artemis program, compare them to the costs of the Apollo program, compare the capabilities, even the things like the orbits, because the orbits for the Artemis program are substantially different than the orbits for the Apollo program. It'll be a really fun, uh, fun next dive. And then after that, we'll get into the lunar landers and kind of do a deep dive on commercial options to replace SLS and Orion in the future. So um, it'll be a fun set of videos. So, so hopefully you guys enjoyed. Part one's doing really well. It seems like you guys have responded well to that. So if you haven't watched that, definitely check that out. It's a little bit longer like normal, um, but I'm trying to do a mixture of long and short. So you guys don't, yeah. <laughs> keep some something for everybody but that's gonna do it for me guys uh yeah i'll catch you guys in a little bit i'm tim dodd the everyday astronaut bringing space down to earth for everyday people bye everybody